Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Nasratullah Tafuri. I'm a PhD uh, candidate at Osaka University here in Japan. And I'm the moderator for today's session. Welcome to Exhibitor, Exhibitor Truck. Uh, for today's session, uh, Mr. Adam Brown will have his speech on over a decade of software security, what we learned. So, uh, Mr. a short introduction of Mr. Adam Brown. Adam has been measuring maturity of software security initiatives in financial technology and government organizations since 2019. So, uh, if you have any question, please post your questions to the Q&A section on the top of this video to Wuha. I will ask your questions at the last 10 minutes of Q&A sessions and Mr. Adam will answer it. And the chat functionality of Zoom is disabled for attendance. So if you would like to chat or comment, please use the HUA uh, in order to chat and uh, comment. What to you, Adam? Let's get started. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Nazrat. Uh, just before uh, I share my screen, then uh, I'll just say hello so you can see me because I, I think my, my, I will disappear. Um, in, in my talk, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, the BSIM, which has been going on for uh, nearly 14 years now. Uh, and I'm going to cover five things that, that I said I would in, uh, in the preamble that is, how to measure software security, um, security metrics, really briefly. Uh, a little bit on holistic efforts, why more isn't always better, and then trends that we've seen in the last uh, in the last couple of years uh, over the, the BSIM measurements that, that, that we've done. So I shall share my screen now. Uh, please shout me out if you if you don't see it. Yeah. Looking for what? Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, over a decade of uh, software security, uh, what have we learned? So um, let's just skip through that. What I want to do, first of all, is just differentiate between what BSIM is and who are Synopsys, because sometimes when I've done talks like this, people say, well, who, who's the company? Well, Syn Synopsys is the company and, and it sponsors the BSIM. The BSIM is uh, a, a, an open project that, uh, well, at least the, the output of it is uh, is open in terms of the document that is, is free to download and uh, and use as, as you wish. Uh, so Synopsys uh, is a software security uh, company. Um, and uh, BSIM is one of the strategic kind of tools that, that, that we use to measure the state of software security in companies today. So um, we, we, of course, deliver strategic consulting and tactical consulting. And as you might expect uh, from any software security company, things like training, penetration testing, mobile assessments, and everything you see there. So um, that's enough about Synopsys. Um, and, and let's just get straight into uh, into the BSIM. Okay, so BSIM, um, BSIM 12, which is the current iteration of it, it's been going since uh, 2008. So it's uh, it's coming up to 15 years uh, that it's been going on now. And in that time to date, we've, we've done well over 550 assessments. And that's been contributions from 231 firms. The, the way it's done, it's uh, interview driven assessments and um, they're, they're done to aggregate the actual practices performed by the companies that make up the data pool that drives the BSIM into a single observational framework. So it's a really good way to identify the state of software security in the world today and, uh, and also how you might stack up against your peers or um, or, uh, or, or all of the other the contributors. So just here's some of the uh, the contributing companies uh, that, that work with us to, to, to do this. Um, not all of them obviously are listed there. And if you want to see a full list, well, a fuller list, download the BSIM. Not everyone is, uh, is documented in there because for confidentiality reasons, some, some, uh, some uh, contributors don't want to be identified. It's mainly US, um, the, the, the data pool, uh, three quarters of it. 
And then in terms of the actual verticals that contribute, it's um, it's twenty percent software creators, software vendors, and uh, the other, well, twenty eight percent is financial services and technology, uh, with ten percent of uh, fintech and eighteen percent being financial. So, um, what is it? Well, it, it's we we collect quantitative data. So this is what companies are doing and these are the activities which i'm going to talk about in in the first section of this talk and then we also collect qualitative data so this is well how are those companies achieving those things those activities and that's described in the uh, in the description so we organize this using something called the software security framework you might see uh, you know there, there are some similarities between sam you know that's also a software security maturity measurement tool and uh, uh, and uh, with the BSIM we have a similar thing. Instead of pillars, we have domains. Uh, being uh, starting with governance on the left hand side, so everything that you need to manage the process to deployment on the right hand side, which is you know like kind of engineering grassroots activities to uh, ensure secure software. So uh, and then in the middle, of course, we've got practices. So the, these sorry intelligence. These are the smarts that you need, you know, to to create secure software. So there's things like attack models in there, and then. SSDL touch points, which is what we all know is, is about software security. It's uh, you know pipelines and activities around actually uh, cutting code, um, and then deployment, which is where you might see uh, software environments and configuration management, and, and of course, end testing, which which we'll all be familiar with. So here are the practices. Um, there are twelve practices. They're divided equally across the uh, the domains. So in governance, we look at strategy and metrics compliance and policy and training and i won't read out the rest you, you can you can see these slides later yourselves and um, there are three practices per domain now inside each practice we uh, have a bunch of activities so i shall just take an example here with training and um, so inside training we have a handful of uh, of activities and they're divided into levels and each activity, of course, it's got a, a, a reasonably long name there, but it could be slightly ambiguous. So there's a description behind each and each and every activity to remove any uh, ambiguation. So in here, we're looking at training level 1.1. You can see 76 of uh, everybody that contributes the data, 76 out of 128 contributors uh, do this. And, and, and it just kind of, so, so this is where we're talking about um, software security awareness training so it differentiates this that you know th this isn't obviously cyber security training this is um training that's made available to software engineers and any anyone involved in the sslc to help them create um uh, secure uh, secure software so of course this is split into levels so level one um uh, activities are the most commonly observed uh, uh, activities so of course they will be probably slightly easier to conduct but the, the BSIM is a little bit different to other maturity models in that the levels aren't like do this do this harder do this even harder still it's um, the, the most commonly observed all the way through to the least frequently observed and it could be at least you know less less frequently observed because uh, it could be a new activity, right? It could be something that we've detected people are doing that we want to measure against. It could be that it's actually really hard or quite specialist. So there's a number of reasons that you would have um, activities falling into, into different levels. So um, as part of the, um, the measurement, uh, firms get a scorecard and actually, um, uh, if you were to, if you download the BSIM yourself, go to BSIM.com and download it. And also, I've got some QR codes at the end, or, or you know, links that you can use to to get direct access. I think there may be a paywall there, um, not a paywall, uh, marketing wall. So you you can get direct access. The um, the, the, the scorecard drives the, the rest of the report. So all of the graphs that you'll see, um, and, and it, it just forms the, the, the state of, um, of the, well, the, the known state of software security in the firm that's just been measured. So you can, you can have a go at the scorecard yourself, um, you know, look at all of the activities, they're all documented in the BSIM, and try and work out if, uh, you know, if, if your firm is um, 
observed, observedly doing these activities or, or not. Just know that um, because firms do tend to uh, be a, maybe a bit lenient with themselves and maybe have a, a, a an overall more positive score than actually a calibrated assessor like a synopsis assessor might be able to deliver for you. Um, so yeah, there are, there are 122 of these activities, so it takes some time to do these assessments. Um, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm in Copenhagen right now and we've, we've spent four days on site doing interviews. Um, uh, but the, the, the output gives uh, leadership stakeholders context and structure and potential prioritization for activities that they might want to, uh, to start if they're not already doing. So um, I said we would talk about um, some, some metrics because the, the BSIM is kind of a, in some ways a, a giant metric, um, or it can be certainly if it's, if it's repeated. So organizations we saw are, are learning to translate their risk into numbers. We saw firms putting more effort into collection and publishing of their software security initiative data demonstrated by a 30% increase in one of the activities, which is publish data about software security internally. Um, we saw that increase over the last uh, 24 months. And, and the activity is really about making information about what's happening when you're creating this software related to uh, security activities, uh, and then presenting that usually to uh, executives or even you know, uh, uh, circulating it inside the organization to promote a culture of software security. So I just want to talk about uh, metrics versus measures because perhaps they're used too interchangeably in businesses. Um, and some people assume that, that you know that someone is talking about one thing when when they're talking about something else. So uh, really, the, the, the way I like to think about it is, is I use fuel or in a car. So um, that's a measure, right? If I've got if that gauge said twenty liters, all it tells me is I've got twenty liters. It's up to me then to work out what's that going to do for me. How far am I get? Uh, how far am I going to get? Whereas if I look at uh, the metric from uh, my car, it tells me, it, it doesn't tell me how many liters there are at all, actually. It just tells me how far I can go, depending on my known driving state. Am I, am I driving really carefully or like a maniac? Um, it, it, if this was an electric car, it would take into account things like temperature and, and so on. It gives you range. So the point of the, the, the parable is, um, if you as the driver of the executive, um, you know, a CISO or something, you want the kind of information presented to you in the most easily digestible and actionable way. And that's the difference between a metric and a measure. Metrics provide a better comparative value uh, over collections of measures. Uh, it gives consistency in observation process and consistency, of course, in meaning. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes on um, what security metrics must have and must not have. So the really must, for a software security measurement, there's no way other way, it has to measure software development lifecycle compliance. Therefore, you need to get telemetry from primary gates. Um, and then it, it, it must create a feedback loop to enhance the SSDL. It must look at the data, real data, and, and consider factors of the, the program execution and risk. What it should do is correlate data from multiple sources. It should uh, strive for good time series data. So it should be repeated at a regular cadence and compare the value of, of your efforts. Uh, it should test your theories, uh, your intuitions, and, and perhaps it might uh, prove them wrong. Uh, and it should tell your application security if, it, if it's done right. Um, when metrics are broken, um, you, you've got to fix them. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's really quite pointless. You're going to tell people to go in the wrong direction. Um, and, and they should ultimately enable you to maximize uh, your, your spend on, on software security. And, and, and that's why you should avoid just looking at the bottom bullet point here, rushing metrics development. Put, you, 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 if you if you put the time and effort into having a quality metrics program, it will be embraced by uh, executives and it will garner further investment, maybe even to your metrics program, they'll want more of that, but also um, into actually the, the software security initiative. So don't 
don't complicate the numbers accidentally or intentionally just just put some quality in there and absolutely don't make up the numbers and really don't make up stories about made up numbers so what does the bsim tell us about metrics what did we see um uh, firms in the data pool do well we saw um uh, an increase in the published data about software security uh, uh, internally. So just 53% of firms in BSIM 12, although that's up from 39% in, in BSIM 9, are publishing data about their software security initiative within the organization. So if you compare that with 92% that have identified gate locations, so they've ident identified source, uh, sources of data for their metrics, which is up from 84% in BSIM 9, there's, they're not massively using that data to, to create, uh, create metrics, although they're kind of on a journey in the last two or three years to do that. So um, only 16% of firms, and that's only up 1% from BSIM 9, are using metrics really formally enough to allow the firm to drive financial decisions about their software security uh, initiatives. Okay, um, that said, uh, I'll, I'll move on to the next section because yeah, we, we haven't got too long. Um, th th this, this is about um, putting in a, in, together a quality software security initiative. I just want to qu uh, qualify this really. So the software security initiative is the thing that we're measuring, right? Now, um, that needs to have a software security group to drive it and it needs sponsorship from executive management. But a software security initiative isn't just doing a bunch of things like, you know, let's do a bunch of pen tests or let's just make sure we code review everything. It, it, it's got to be fairly holistic. So if we look at this graph here, this is this is something that comes out of the BSIM report and and this one you can get directly from from the BSIM report you can you can download and um, it, it shows uh, the uh, activities around the clock uh, related to the domain. So we've got the governance domain from uh, from 12 o'clock till 2 o'clock, intelligence from 3 till 5, and, and so on. So you get the picture, that's what the spider chart's telling you, you've got the practices uh, inside each of those, those domains there. Ultimately, um, this is an aggregate of, of everybody that's in the data pool. So there are 128 participants, and we... Um, we, we, we strive for data freshness. So if, if a firm hasn't remeasured within, uh, within uh, just under three years, then they're dropped from the data pool because of course, there's no point analyzing data that's 10 years old. We want to look at the state of software security initiatives today. Um, so of the 128 firms, this is, this is kind of what they're doing. You can see there's a bit of a dip in attack models. Firms aren't necessarily doing that, but they're, 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 they've got a good grasp on standards and requirements. So ultimately, and of course, you're going to see this with, a, with 128 firms all, all contributing to this average, uh, you're going to see a fairly rounded shape. And when you perform your own measurement, really what you're also looking for is, is at least some kind of fairly rounded shape. And, and, and those rounded shapes aren't necessarily always that common. What we're seeing here in, in this graph is a comparison of different verticals from the data pool. So um, the, the green uh, section is, uh, is cloud firms, uh, the light blue section is Internet of Things firms, and the purple section is, um, is uh, software vendors. So you can see they've got slightly different uh, shapes. And that's because of the, the different uh, kind of market forces that are in play on them. Maybe they have to be heavily regulated or, uh, or, or maybe they're, they're highly, uh, highly technical uh, and therefore uh, you know, get, uh, get the technology uh, right more quickly. So uh, what you don't want to see in, in your score is you know, big spikes or big drops, big troughs in, in there. Here's another way of looking at the data. This is what we call the equalizer chart. And uh, it's a good way to identify, you know, what, what you might call a hollow practice. So you've got the level one activities at the bottom, the level two activities in the middle, and the, in, in yellow, you've got the level three activities. This actually represents a fairly good um, holistic strategy, barring one thing. There, there's nothing happening in security testing, which is odd, given how uh, everything else seems to be fairly well-rounded. 
they've got a good foundational set of level one activities and two uh, and there's a there's a, a smattering of level three activities a, another uh, uh, pitfall might be if you, if you had a bunch of level three activities but not the level one and two activities you'd have to ask, ask, ask the question certainly leadership would ask you why are we doing all these like weird not not necessarily weird sorry but uh, specialist rare less common things but we're not doing the basics so it's just a good way to to measure out what you what you're doing so a, a really useful metric for i you know to, to prove your own performance here is uh, is what you can get from from this graph what we've got across the um the, uh, the the x-axis is buckets of scores so you can score up to 122 you know there are 122 activities i don't think ever, anyone's ever scored 122 but some firms in the 61 to 122 uh, bracket there are 10 firms that have managed to get there that's the rightmost uh, bar whereas on the leftmost side you've got some firms there are is that 12 12 firms have got a, a score between zero and 20. Now, the orange line tells you the average age of the software security group that's driving the software security initiative inside the firm. So it stands to reason that those with a lower score have a more nascent group, um, whereas those with a higher score have got a much more mature group that's been in place for a, a fairly long time. Now, the green is, is, in this case, this is this firm's measurement. Um, they have scored 47, right? So they go into the 41 to 50 bucket. And uh, the typical software security group age for that bucket is around about four and a half years old. However, their software security group is only three years old. So they're outperforming um, their competitors or counterparts, depending on how you slice the data, right? This is, this is everyone that's part of the data pool, but they're doing something right. They're doing something better or they're doing something more quickly. Maybe they have more sponsorship, but it's a good way to, to measure your software security initiative is one, one metric at least anyway. Okay, so that's that's firms that are actually in play. Um, what, what, uh, another useful thing that you can pull for from from the um, uh, the, the BSIM is how to how to kickstart, how to bootstrap uh, a software security initiative to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. It's very hard. Or as Baron von Munchausen here is doing, he's uh, pulling himself out of a swamp by his own ponytail. It's about self-starting. So. Where would you start if you just start as an application security manager or director and, and you're responsible for this, this thing, this initiative, which is software security in the firm? Well, what we saw was there are two types of um, uh, 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 software security initiative. There's a governance led and there's the engineering led. Add to that in the report, we talk about emerging um, uh, emerging initiatives, so just starting from scratch. So these are firms that are taking ad hoc activities and moving to a more holistic strategy. We looked at maturing um, uh, initiatives, so uh, an existing initiative tied to executive expectations and they're tasked with improving things, all the way through to enabling um, uh, SSIs. So um, this is uh, uh, software security initiatives that are achieving software security at scale of expertise and coverage and tool integration and accuracy and so on. So actually, there are six different ways that you could pitch yourself. Uh, you could just be a beginner and governance led, or you could be uh, maturing and, and engineering led. And, and there's some useful information in the BSIM for you to, uh, to digest in there. If we look at what uh, firms are doing, you can see the governance led guys start with a compliance and policy uh, type of activities. So um, it, one of the most important things that, that they'll do and that any, I would say, well, it is vital for a, a success of a software security initiative is to create the software security group, hire someone or get someone uh, to take ownership of the software security initiative. And that person has to have a fairly uh, close or direct reporting line to executive management. One of the things we look for is um, the collect data on the, the, the reporting line to the CEO, because no software security initiative will be successful without executive sponsorship. Um, if you look at the, the bottom, they've got the engineering led uh, kind of activities. 
Um, so those guys start with things with low friction stuff. So um, this is security features and design type of activities. So these are to integrate and deliver security features that engineers can just pick up and, and use it in, in, in their own code, or they engage directly with the architecture teams to help them with things like threat modeling and, and uh, design review. And then in the middle, we've got both engineering and governance led, which of course, yeah, if you work together, you, you, you probably um, uh, start with more and, uh, and you get better traction. So just to start with, um, it's, so if you're a governance led um, a person in a, in, in a firm, and you've got to you've got to create this software security initiative for for some reasons. Maybe there's an executive decision we need to address software security. First thing you must do is put someone in charge of the software security initiative and give them what they need for success. Sponsorship with executives, probably some budget, some power. The next thing is to inventory your software. So know what you have, know where it is and when it changes. Now, it's not just me saying these things. This is what we've observed firms doing. This is this is how people, how firms do it, right? Then uh, once you've inventory, decide on the scope. You can't boil the ocean. Uh, so decide what you're gonna focus on first and then contribute to its work streams. Regarding infrastructure, don't put good software on bad systems in poorly constructed networks. Of course, um, you've got to get that right. Um, because those, those systems are typically cloud systems these days, but make sure the configuration is, uh, is secure. Do perform defect discovery. So determine what today's issues are. What is your technical debt pile looking like? And then plan for tomorrow. It's always painful because you know you, you you find things and it looks like things are bad and engineering are going to complain because they've got extra work to do. But you know it is stuff that needs to fi be fixed, and then you've got to define how you're going to fix it. So you need to engage with uh, with uh, development. So find those responsible uh, for delivery pipelines or. Uh, key designs or, or, or code pieces and, and involve them in the planning and implementation rollout at scale of your, your, your activities. Um, so and start with the controls that establish some risk management to prevent recurrence of the issues that you see today, right? So the things that you found in defect discovery, how are you going to prevent them happening in future? And that's where feedback loops start to come in place. And then implement your own feedback loop. Metrics are great for this as well. Um, start with a bite-sized uh, approach, expand the team, improve your inventory, automate the basics, uh, and, and then add more prevention and then repeat again. So what about engineering led? Well, th there are some uh, similarities, of course, you know, inventory your software. And um, with, with scope though, engineering, engineering led groups have been observed using uh, these three things as input for prioritizing their scope. So velocity, um, so teams conducting active and new development or major refactoring, there's an opportunity to, 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 uh, to, to move. Um, regulation, so services or data repositories with specific requirements for security or privacy. And opportunity, so teams solving critical technical challenges or adopting key technology can be proving grounds for emerging security controls. Again, don't put good software on poor infrastructure. Um, and then uh, choose your application controls that deliver the right features and prevent some classes of vulnerabilities. Software uh, features, uh, secure, security features and design stuff, you know, reusable uh, libraries and uh, authentication mechanisms, role-based access control systems and so on. And again, repeat. So we're seeing the merging of governance-led and engineering-led efforts around software security. And it's something that, that we've definitely tracked in the vSIM and we've seen that for the last two or three years. Historically, there was like this centralized governance view, a team at corporate, maybe called the AppSec team or the software security team or the product security team. And they were setting governance and buying tools and running them centrally and setting policy to, for, for, for build permits. And, and you could only uh, get gate passage if the tool said it was OK. Um, now, that was OK for the time, but now it's too slow and, and engineering moves too fast. Now we see that security is happening in the engineering organizations in firms. 
In engineering, there might be cloud security or container security or DevSec or SecOps. So these are the people that are popping up and growing inside engineering. So we have the rise of the second generation engineering led security efforts. So, well, that's great. The, the thing is, these individual silos don't necessarily know what it means to manage the risk for an entire firm. So we see that we're soon driving towards a hybrid where centralized governance of application security and distributed democratized engineering of application security must come back together so that we can agree on meeting both feature velocity and cadence uh, in, in the engineering teams, but not risking the whole uh, organization. In short, engineers don't see what puts the firm at risk and governance guys don't have a view of what causes friction for engineering. So what we're seeing here with these three, three, three circles is uh, it's a general view of two cultures that are, are often at odds. Engineering groups want to deploy application features and get quickly customer feedback and governance groups want to manage risk across the entire application portfolio. So the diverging properties and priorities aren't going to go away, but DevSecOps can help stakeholders meet in the middle. And the new BSIM activities that we've been measuring are definitely reflecting this growing change. So, you know, DevSecOps has been talked about for, for years and we're actually seeing it, which science, science is proving that it's actually happening in the measurements that we're performing. So engineers want feature velocity, they want to automate first, they want resilience, uh, they want to test in the value stream and, and they don't want production environments to be sacred. Whereas the governance guys want rules and checkpoints and compliance and centralized testing and, and they really want to remove all risk. But there are shared goals, for example, resiliency, it means something slightly different to each group. By and large, the engineers want resiliency so that software doesn't just fail at the first sign of adversity. Maybe the DNS went down or someone ran a chaos monkey against it. Uh, they want the software to be good and robust. Uh, by and large, the governance guys want to know if someone's attacking the firm through the software, they can do something about it, not necessarily through log analysis and incident management, but that the software is secure enough that it can protect itself against the attack. That is, it doesn't have the vulnerabilities in it in the first place that the bad guys are looking for. So while resiliency means slightly different things in each camp, it is somewhere where the two can come together. It can start to think, what does this mean for us instead of what it means independently? because it considers risk, posture, tone at the top, resourcing, and other things. So in summary, putting tools into a CI CD chain uh, with some DevOps teams, it doesn't necessarily make DevSecOps. Um, hopefully what you can see is really about culture and it's about integrating um, what you're doing. Uh, so uh, it's, it's much more about uh, just integrating tools. So final section really here, this is the, the trends that we've observed in, uh, in software security activities. So we, we track these uh, activities taken or, or facilitated by software security groups. And of course they change over time and that's why we have data, this data freshness policy. Um, and, and they change in line with software security group priorities. A good measurement interval for firms is about 24 months, sometimes it's 18 months, so that, that means that you know they're doing a BSIM every couple of years. Um, so let's then look at the, the differences between BSIM 12, the current iteration of BSIM, and BSIM 10 from a couple of years ago. So there's been an emphasis on uh, supply chain software security, we're seeing that um, obviously, we hear about it marketing wise, um, but we're seeing it um, through the BSIM lens as well, through what we're observing. And, and, and of course, high profile ransomware attacks have probably driven that software security attacks uh, are, are driving it, uh, the, these increases in, in these related activities. So with regards to open source software, um, there's been a 60% increase in the identification of open source software and then a, a control uh, of, of the use of open source software. So commonly this is achieved using some automated tools to find uh, binaries, whole libraries, or even snippets of cut and paste code um, 
that engineers have, have, have used. Um, I think what you can say is a few years ago, we used to say that there's no excuse for not doing static analysis. And, and it's fairly ubiquitous these days. These days, you can probably include software composition analysis in that statement too. So with vendors, there's been almost a 60% increase in the observation of firms putting software security specific service level agreements, SLAs, um, into their contracts to make sure that the vendors don't jeopardize the firm's compliance story or, or their actual you know, software security initiative. So provisions are typically around things like policy conformance, incident management, uh, training, defect management, software issue response times. So they, they are, I mean, you, you probably will, will commonly find um, cybersecurity uh, SLAs in there, but, but some, you know, what we look for here is, is actually um, software security related stuff. So, you know, it could be training or, you know, doing code review and doing it properly. Okay, so SBOM is an acronym that's become uh, fairly popular over the, the, the last uh, last few years. In um, in the twenty twenties, Gartner had predict Gartner had predicted that um, by twenty twenty four, the provision of a detailed, regularly updated software bill of materials by software vendors will be a non negotiable for at least half of enterprise software uh, buyers. Um, and, and it has done um, because we, we've seen this increase in um, in, in, the, in, in the use of a, a software bill of materials. And um, of course, it's never practical as a manual effort and, and firms are using tools to identify open source in, in the first place. One thing we didn't see is um, the automation of malicious code detection. In fact, only one firm out of 128 had actually successfully done this. Um, it, it's hard, right? It, it needs the use of automation to detect things like backdoors, and logic bombs, um, dangerous code like time bombs on nefarious communication channels, dynamic code injection, obfuscated program language, uh, program lo logic, sorry, a anything that could be targeted as a, as a backdoor attack. So custom rules in, in a static analysis tool can be used to codify acceptable and unacceptable code patterns. And, and, and while not all backdoors uh, and, and similar kind of dodgy functionality were meant to be malicious, but they do tend to remain in deployed code and should be treated as malicious until proven otherwise. Um, so hopefully we'll see an uptick in, 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 that, um, in, in subsequent recent measurements. There's been a shift towards continuous defect discovery and, uh, and continuous effort. So we, we said years ago, there's no excuse for no SAS and, and then now it's becoming no excuse for no SCA as well. And, and it's increasing, right? Um, it, we're seeing DAST getting into pipelines, interactive applica application security testing getting into pipelines. Cloud security posture management getting in right at the air, you know, really in, in, in production in the last uh, 24 months. Um, we, we're seeing more uh, granularity, um, the, the decomposition of these security gates. So instead of like one big one saying go, no go, there's been a drive to test early and test often. And this has seen firms decomposing efforts into smaller, timely uh, checks. So data indicates important efforts like incremental security design efforts, um, conversion of manual effort to as code efforts, satellite outreach and, and uh, automated, automated asset discovery are, are, are happening. So we've coined this phrase shift everywhere. Um, there's, there's been a realization that sometimes deployment orchestration or post deployment environments are, are the earliest and best possible time uh, to, to do some tests. So shift left that we're so, so familiar with, it really becomes shift everywhere or shift right as in, you know, shift correctly um, shift appropriately. Uh, it extends the idea of making security testing continuous throughout the software lifecycle. So that means smaller, faster pipeline driven security tests are conducted at the earliest opportunity. 
that could be a design, uh, you know, looking at the, the designs and, and breaking the design, or it could be all the way in production with uh, cloud, um, cloud security posture management tools that are monitoring uh, asset creation and configuration uh, monitoring of those uh, created assets. So finally, um, we're seeing governance of co as code. In uh, BSIM 12, observations indicate that sole source uh, software security standards and policy documents, so those things that said thou shalt do this and must not do other things, um, uh, 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 moving from you know document-based uh, uh, artifacts to becoming human-readable configuration code or simplified code that conducts vulnerability discovery. And, and this is really the essence of software development lifecycle governance. Um, and, and that's been seen in, uh, uh, we've seen a 15% increase in the last two years of firms, uh, firms doing that. Okay, so so final, final slide now. Um, th th there's some other trends that we observed and a couple of things that we hoped for but didn't necessarily see too, too much of. Um, there's been a shift away from mandating software security, big stick kind of approach, like you've got to use my tool because I bought it and the CEO says so. It's a more of a partnership kind of collaborative approach uh, with sharing of staff and resources and uh, knowledge and, and, and actually contributing directly towards software security efforts in the critical path of software delivery. Uh, there's been significant, really significant increases in observation rates for uh, the application, the, the, this activity, application containers to support security goals and orchestration for containers and virtualized environments. That doesn't mean like, oh, yeah, we're using Kubernetes, so we're, we're secure. Uh, it's more of a case of that is an opportunity to make sure that your environment is secure through configuration, hardening and benchmarking and, and uh, standards and so on. Um, we saw organizations are learning how to translate risk into numbers. Uh, we saw a 30% increase in, in the activity published data about software security internally. Um, however, what we didn't really see a, a big increase in it was uh, the normalizing and deduplication of defect data and customizing uh, testing tools. And that's important because that's about the quality of the data that you're reporting. So while firms are kind of getting some measurements uh, and, and in some cases metrics, um, we probably see, need to see an increase in the, the quality of data that's going in, right? So you, if, if you automate noise reduction using aggregation tools and uh, you know, you know, things to automate kind of false positives uh, being triaged correctly, and then if you actually customize testing tools so they don't you know, uh, come, come, come up with inaccurate results in the first place, then we can see metrics get even better. Um, there were very few instances of um, normalizing and deduplicating defect data and customizing uh, testing tools. Um, so, so anyway, next thing was that there was uh, we didn't see the creation of uh, context aware security requirements. So this includes the use of pre-approved security frameworks and design patterns um, and abuse cases. So, you know, secure patterns that the engineers can use and, and the security features that you could just roll into your code. Um, OK, excuse the drill noise. Sorry, it's a noisy hotel, this one, it seems. So, in conclusion, well, first of all, please do take a look at the BSIM. Um, all of this information that I've presented is in that report. There's a Trends and Insights report. That's uh, almost like the TLDR version. Uh, and then there's a the Foundations report, which is a fairly weighty tome with all of the, uh, the activities inside of it. So, in summary, um, you can't. There's no switch to turn security on. You can't just say, "Hey, can I have that?" But in secure mode, you, you really must build it in. And increasingly, we're seeing automated ways to do that. The goal should be auditable governance as code. Uh, automating manual compliance adherence tasks makes them more consistent, efficient, and repeatable. Um, use metrics. 
use them to help the decision makers make the right decision about software security. I guess it's easy to say, oh, the guys at the top don't know what's going on, but you really have to kind of, maybe it feels like doing the job for them, but you know, the, you're, you're, as the kind of experts on the ground, you can actually translate it into terms that they can really understand. So consider multiple disciplines, cloud containers, um, orchestration, security, source content management, and measure what you can and make it as, as relevant as possible for the firm um, to, to make decisions. Have the right activities running at the right, right time. So implement small phase-based security activities throughout the life cycle, rather than using big, uh, slow pass-fail gates that delay pipeline progress. Um, and, and then use the telemetry that comes from these things. Gather data on what tests ran, what was found, and, and use that to drive improvements. Um, where, where you should start. So yeah, if, if you are starting out, if you're optimizing, or if you're actually doing really well, there are, there's information in the BSIM that, that can uh, help you in that, not that we as uh, the custodians of the data will, will directly tell you, it's more what your peers in the data pool are doing. Uh, and and you know, it could give you some ideas as to where to go next. So finally, as we've seen with BSIM, maturation continues and uh, we look forward to seeing what BSIM firms are doing in um, when we release BSIM 13 which will be towards uh, well pro probably in the autumn of, uh, of this year okay so thank you very much I think I've finished in just about enough time if there's any questions please uh, uh, I, yeah well let me hand over to Nazrat who, who can tell you what to do about questions Well, Adam, uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. Tons of information and I really enjoy. Thank you so much. So I would look into the uh, participants' questions and uh, probably if you can take your time, maybe we have 10 minutes uh, to answer the participants' uh, questions. So we got a question, it says, what's the, what are the major difference between Sam and BSIM. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, thank you. So, um, Sam uh, is, um, I think they were created around about the same time, actually. Um, Sam is, um, is uh, has got a bunch of activities, it's got domains and, and, and practices, but it, it, it perhaps lacks a, a data pool. Um, so, it, it's perhaps a bit prescriptive. Whereas um, BSIM is different in that it's descriptive. So it measures what's happening in, in, in the industry and then that shapes the, the, the BSIM. So what you might find is, you know, Sam quite rightly might, might take some of the new activities that are observed as growing in the BSIM um, and, and use that. Uh, I think that, that yeah, so, so the, the major difference is it, it has a data pool behind it and, and therefore it's descriptive. Um, um, and, and it, it is, uh, yeah, but similarity wise, it, it is a report that we put out every year. I don't know if, if some do that, I, I guess they do, um, uh, which can, can help you define your software security initiative, but I'd say prescriptive versus descriptive. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Let me move to the, um, second question from the audience. So. The second question is, who can deliver BSIM assessment? Can well, I the good news is um, you, you could you could try it for yourself. So um, there's a scorecard in there and there's all the activities in there and all the descriptions in there. So there's nothing to stop you spending time to do an initial assessment. And, and sometimes, you know, for, for nascent uh, software security initiatives it might be even if, if if you spoke to um, somebody in synopsis, they, they might actually turn around and say, "Don't don't do a BSIM with us. Um, just go and start yourself, because you know we, we can probably tell you now your score is going to be quite low. Um, so go and work out what you need to do to shape your SSI to kick it off, and then maybe get a proper measurement in in a couple of years. Um, 
so uh, in in terms of uh, who who else can measure it do do a um, a, a, a direct measurement well uh, of course we do and we with the custodians of the data pool if you are measured your data can go into that data pool um and uh, and it's how to become part of the uh, the BSIM um uh, club if you like there's there's a a conference and uh, and, and uh, forums and so on that, that are pretty active uh, I guess some consultants, independent consultants would, would do that. You, you would miss the data pool. Um, you would miss the collaboration, uh, sorry, not collaboration, calibration. So uh, as a as a, um, a, uh, a calibrated assessor, the idea is whether you use me or one of the consultants in New York, within a couple of points, we, we should come up with, with the same score. We actually, the, the interviews are driven usually with, with three, three assessors or calibrated. Whereas if you're not part of the calibration process, you can't guarantee that the score is going to be really a, an accurate re reflection of what everybody else in the data pool would have scored if they, if they used synopsis. Oh, uh, thank you, Adam. And uh, we got a question and it says, my company is a bit specialist. How can the BSIM can re relevant to uh, companies who are not mainstream? So um, they, when the BSIM started in 2008, it was with the nine original firms in the US. Uh, so think of some big names and you can probably work out who they were. We're talking about financial services organizations on, on the East Coast and um, software companies, cloud companies on the West Coast. And the original thought was we're gonna have to have two models because surely banks make deal maintain software uh, in a very different way to software companies and after doing these measurements and creating the software security framework it was realized that actually no ultimately they're all producing software and um, they might be doing it in slightly different ways um, but you, you can really harmonize a lot of the activities that are happening which is what we've done with uh, with the activities and continue to do every year um, so there's there's no no special snowflakes, if you like. I, I, th I think if you're creating software, if you're maintaining software, it's relevant. If you're not doing that, then yeah, it doesn't make sense. But we have in the data pool everything from like IoT vendors, telcos, cloud service providers, all the way through to uh, banks and, and governments. Um, there's 122 activities. No one ever really scores 122 altogether, although some do score quite highly because, you know, that some of the perhaps specialist, more more slightly specialist for, for activities like highly governed um, organizations will, you know, will, will probably do better in, in, in governance, whereas, uh, you know, super technical telcos might do better with technical testing and, and, and so on. But it, it fits everybody, every firm. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we got three questions and probably we're going to have time. So it's the end of uh, probably the QA session. So uh, do you have something extra to add, Adam? No, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your, uh, your attention today. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, pleasure is mine. Thank you very much. So let's wrap up this session, uh, probably the first session of Exhibit Track.